who do you support? Arsenal. Mm, that's difficult. <laughs> that it must be difficult it's, for you. It's a, I feel like it's not difficult anymore. I feel like you we, we've it? come Just to a... We, we plateaued and we, yeah, we yeah. are... Expectations now are, are finally yeah, it's, sort of... It's, you know, we have to just manage our expectations. Mm. I've seen, you know, I've seen us talk about having a good crop of young boys before. For years, I've, seen, I've seen the different eras. I've seen, you know, the Walcotts and the Chamberlains mm. and the, the Wilshires and around. And a lot of them came good, but just didn't ever yeah. come good as a And collective. even like they started bad this year and now they sort of picked up and everyone's saying, actually, are we going to turn to decent tier? And then they just let you down a little bit again. Yeah, Arsenal is setting yourself up for heartbreak. Mm. But do you know what's not setting yourself up for heartbreak? It's watching an episode of the Property by Kazi podcast. And you are back and I do the best introductions. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button so we can see that you're enjoying this. If you haven't already, make sure you hit the like button. Today I'm here with Chris Ribeiro. I've asked how to pronounce that three times and he's about to tell me that I pronounced it wrong again. No, Ribeiro's fine. Ribeiro's fine, honestly. I've had Ribeiro, I've had Ribeiro, I've had all sorts. But Ribeiro, I, yeah. I like that. Did yeah. you In like Portuguese, that? I think they like take the, the R out as a Ribeiro. They sort of like rolls off like that. Ribeiro sounds like you're guaranteed a Megs or two. Like. <laughs> well, that's it. I wasn't the most skillful player, so I think like when managers signed me, they probably thought I'd be a little bit more skillful than I was. So you know what? I'm a bit downhearted. There, there is like... An, an almost unfair expectation yeah, that so. if you've if you've got the the Spanish the yeah, Portuguese well, name if they said they, if they looked at my no one's expecting said, a Pepe yeah you, exactly you know. they said like half Portuguese and I turned out like the palest half Portuguese <laughs> man in the world they probably had a shock but it is what it is now but it's good to have you down where have you come from today so I came from South Manchester today that's where my business is up there so I've, I've moved I'm an adopted northerner now so yeah. I moved up there so you, and you said you were from so I'm from Swansea originally okay and then my family moved across to Gloucestershire so I grew up a lot of my time in in sort of um, around Cheltenham, Stroud, that sort of uh, part of the world, and spent mm. a lot of time in Bristol. Then that okay, was like... so you travelled because us Londoners, you know, we're like we're a breed in our in mm-hmm. our own. We don't really. Vent- oh, like, I'm no. from South London, yeah, yeah, and we're even known as even worse. We're like some yeah. some people see us like the trolls under yeah. the bridge. That so you don't, don't go, like... you don't go past Birmingham ever, do you? Birmingham, yeah. I don't go past <laughs> the Thames. <laughs> well, you have to come up Manchester. Manchester is I'm, London at the north. I'm, I'm 2022. I've committed to if you invite me to some you of your should. projects, I'm going to come, come down because yeah, I want to venture out more and see, see what's going I'm, on. The, one of the beauty um, where we are now, we're Stockport based in South Manchester, but you've got the train is two hours direct to London, so mm. London Euston. That's one of the main reasons like Manchester's booming up there. So a lot of the work is going up to Manchester. You have to make sure so you good. plan though, because those trains are expensive. If you try and yeah. catch a train on the same day, you yeah. get an Uber for the same amount. Yeah, sometimes. I know, I know, I know. But but subject to planning in advance, which we do, of mm-hmm. course, as responsible property mm-hmm. developers. I'll be coming up to Manchester yeah, to see what's going on. Make sure you do. So before you, you know, got into property, your background was football. Yeah. And you had a, would you call an up and down? Like Mainly down, I would say, <laughs> because my career, you know, as much as I, I did some good things, I managed to make it professional. I think I came through the Bristol City Academy when mm-hmm. they were championship. I was there from 10 years old, was there till I was 22. So I think I turned pro at about 16, <clears throat> 17. And that was when, that was probably when I was at my peak of my powers, I was sort of next best thing at that sort of age group, playing um, under 21s and getting into the first team squads early. But unfortunately on my debut, I did my knee and my ACL. And a week before, I mentioned to you earlier that uh, I turned down and moved to Everton for a million quid. So that was sort of when I was at my peak mm. potential. But um, when I came back from that, I wasn't rehabbed very well. And my, my ability was athletically, I was so good. So mm. really fast, really agile defender. And when I came back from my knee, I was just never quite the same. It was lucky I was such a good athlete because even losing 20, 30% out of this leg, I still managed to have a career, but it wasn't what I could have been. I, I, I was lucky enough to play a couple of times for Wales, but I played mainly a little bit of championship, but a lot of League One and League Two. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, and mainly in pain. I was retired by 27. So it, 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 yeah, it, it wasn't, um, wasn't how I wanted it to go, but I, I did okay, I guess. But I mean, like, hindsight is always like, that we, we always want more for mm. ourselves, but... You know, if you were to take yourself back to being, you know, a, um, you know, take yourself back yeah. to when you were kicking football around the park, yeah, yeah. then kicking the ball around the park, you're going to say to yourself that the opportunity to be a professional footballer, yeah. the percentage exactly. of people that make it at all, exactly, is no. so is so minimal and so finite yeah. that I think. You know, you have to commend yourself for actually Maybe. getting there as now, well. I think that's just, I think as a sportsman, you're yeah. so ultra competitive and driven. And just me, myself, I'm sort of an overthinker. And you give up so much. You give up your life to be a footballer. Mm-hmm. You know, you have, there's, 
There's no real, well, this especially now in this year where they take them out of schools even earlier, where the socialising isn't the same. You literally have to give up your life to be a footballer. And even then, 0.1% only make it. You know, mm. it's so tough to get there. And, um, yeah, from my, the, the thing for me is I, I guess the unlucky bit was the group I was playing with were, you know, the Welsh year especially, was like the soup sauce. So that's the Gareth Bales, mm. the Aaron Ramsey, the Joanne. That was my group. And I was probably one of the ones who didn't achieve enough. All the other guys went to Premiership and Championship. And there was a handful of us all retired early with injuries, and I was sort of one of those guys. So, unfortunately, I sort of had the taste of the high life early, yeah. and I just couldn't maintain it, and my knee was deteriorating year on year. So, it, it's a shame, but I, I guess I managed to, yeah, make it a little bit. I think no, I think that, and that's the thing. Like you know, we we spoken about this like on a, a few podcasts earlier. I can't remember who it was. I think it was one we had with um, James, and we were talking about you know the idea of failing once doesn't make mm. you a failure you're not failing so mm. but the idea of not achieving what you want to achieve yeah. once doesn't mean you can't go again no. and one of the reasons why or the the reason why I wanted to get you on the podcast wasn't because of that your like your footballing career mm. it was your career thereafter yeah. um, and what you've done since then so can you speak briefly about yeah. what you well basically you know from from my history by doing my knee at uh, 18 19 I, I played in pain all my, mm -hmm. so I was on painkillers every game that I can remember. You know, things like that. And I, I remember I would only, I would train, I couldn't do any extras after training. I was then icing my knee, stretching, icing, just to get through the next day. So it was horrible. So, you know, for that 10 years, I, I, I eked out every single game that I could out of this knee until it finally gave out. But then I guess we spoke earlier, the, the kind of the blessing of that was I knew from the early 20s that I wasn't going to play till I was 30 mm -hmm. or 35 and I wasn't going to play the high level I was hoping. Yeah. And from a monetary standpoint, in the Premiership and Championship, that's where the big money is. That's mm -hmm. where people are in great. From League One, League Two, a lot of those guys are earning good wages, of course, really good for 20 to 30 year olds, but mm -hmm. not, you can never work again sort of wages. So from the early 20s, I was already thinking, what am I going to do after? Because what would be... Like obviously it changes year on year. Yeah, well, sort of like wages. League two ag yeah. average. I think League One, League Two, mm. even in cover, the, you know, between fifteen and hundred grand a year isn't unnormal. You know, for a lot, you'd have to have in League Two, especially League One. There'll be higher ones that are more experienced, whatever, in some of the bigger clubs. But especially since COVID's hit, a lot of the clubs their budgets are absolutely shot. Yeah. They're they're more yeah, out of work footballers than ever yeah. right now. It's getting worse, and the wages have dropped significantly. And for those who are out of contract that need. Uh, uh, contracts at clubs the clubs have all the power so their contracts are given out are like 500 quid a week 800 quid a week because they wait till the last minute when players are desperate and say oh look we'll give you something short mm. but they're used to two grand a week jobs and it's just par for the course unfortunately at yeah, the moment because when you say it when you, when you say it like that and you put it in context that you know anywhere from 150 to sort of 200,000 yeah. pounds you know they're, they're, they're wages that really skilled people mm. but you know consultants GPs yeah. like great days are earning that, that sort of amount. Mm. However, the difference is your career is five times yeah. the length and also you earn more as you, you know, become more experienced. Yeah. Whereas in football it goes like this and then very quickly opposite. like that. Well, and well, my, my experience, my highest wage was at 21. Isn't that bizarre? You know, how many yeah. jobs have it like that? And the other thing people forget in football is you're trained to be an expert in your field, but when you retire, it's gone forever. You yeah. can never kick that ball again. It's gone. You can never use that skill. So most people are training for something. And like you mentioned, mm -hmm. people are going up the ladder over time. In football, you go up the ladder so much, and then by 30, 32, 20, mine was 27, drop off. end. So whilst you can go into coaching mm -hmm. and other things, you are starting down at another ladder. And coaching is a different ball game. There's no security in coaching. Yeah. There's very little money in coaching. So that's the and people... It's, it's super thing, competitive, um, from my understanding. Oh, like yeah. To get, for example, like I had a friend recently that got his, you know, um, I think it was FA, like level four. Yeah. And like that's that's amazing because like to get to that level takes a long yeah. time and it's not just like oh, I've been a footballer yeah. so I can I get that so you well, literally are starting exactly again. for me the the, the coach is because I went to do my um, my B license uh, sorry um, one of my licenses there and I remember sitting down and you sort of it dawns you because I knew saying that a manager in coaching you generally have to start at the bottom you start with the kiddies and everything because like, you have to work your way up mm -hmm. like any other ladder unless you're very fortunate to be. Um, put in with a first team that's very rare but there's no security in coaching so if you imagine your your yeah. pinnacle is to get to be a first team manager of a club you are always five games away from the sack if you lose three five games three nil you're probably sacked yeah. so you're always a month away from being sacked and that could be from bad luck couldn't be anything you've done wrong could be you yeah. get a man sent off in the first minute for five games and you'll get the sack and sometimes and you might never get a chance yeah. again so unless you start at the premiership championship and then you move down you move down 
So security wise, that's terrifying, you know, and that's that's the thing people forget. And when you talk about entry level, the average coaching job burns like twenty four grand a year. Yeah. So if you were a player in two hundred grand a year's example, that's exactly what I was going to say. That if you get that's used to two hundred grand a year, one hundred and fifty grand a year, and you get used to that because they say that it takes six months to mm. learn a habit. Yeah. So the habit of being on you know, by year one, year two, mm -hmm. you're used to being on 200 grand a year. Yeah. And although you fully understand that, you know, you know it's not going to be around forever, it's very easy to put like, the blinders on and just, like, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just a footballer, I focus on football and hope that, you know, it gets yeah. better. And everybody, you know, hope and, yeah. you know, you trust your ability. But at the same time, there's also, the, you know, the, the common sense and being mm -hmm. a bit more prudent to say, where am I going to go? Because if I want to sustain a standard of living of somebody on 200,000 pounds a year, there has to be something more than that. Yeah, well, I think we spoke earlier and it's, you know, it, unfortunately it takes a shock for people to realise that because if you've grown up at a premiership club championship and you've always been used to earning two grand a week, then four grand a week, then eight grand a week, 10 grand a week, it's really hard to value money. And it yeah. takes a shock because as I mentioned to you, these guys have got 10 to 15 years of buying power. It is highly unlikely they will ever earn that money again once they retire. They'd have to do supremely well in a business mm -hmm. in whatever to get to those wages again. That's something that people just don't take seriously until it's too late. Because what you often find is, especially now in COVID, I've seen so much of it, where lads, four, six years ago, there were more, more jobs. Mm -hmm. there, you know, there was more championship clubs paying 10, 15 grand, League One clubs playing three, five, seven grand. And then suddenly COVID hit and their wages dropped 50%. So some of the guys that got hit the most are the guys in that mid band of earning four, six, eight grand a week because those jobs went. League mm -hmm. One weren't paying, suddenly they were paying two grand a week. So the guys that were used to, really good players, experienced players, just so happens a contract it's come to an end. And demand, but now it? their wages have gone down two grand a week. So if you're used to a six grand a week lifestyle, to go down to two grand a week, it's a big difference. There's nothing else you can do about it. And unfortunately, it sometimes takes a shock for people. And, and the sad bit is when they, a lot of them take notes of when they're 28, 30, 32, by then they've already missed out, as we mentioned on three, five, eight years of opportunities they when they could have been growing something. Yeah. We talk, we work in you know, building assets and things, but whatever that their sphere is, a lot of them, they don't see that until it's too late. And then they're stuck with all these debts and all these things they think was a good idea. People told them was a good idea at the time. In the end, it hangs around their neck, you know, like a weight, a dead weight, because how do you afford that sort of lifestyle on a normal person's wage? Because you've got to start at the bottom. Yeah, no, that's, that's completely it. And I think it is the case for a lot of people. And, you know, that, that's a problem. But mm. when, when we look at business, a, a problem or a threat in one industry is always an opportunity in another yeah. industry. And that's where the, the, you know, sort of what a lot of your business is and the service yeah, yeah. that you provide centralizes around so what yeah. is it exactly that you do well so basically my business came from an idea i had when i was i was into property i think i bought my first property at 19 i was lucky mm. enough came through bristol city got a good contract there i bought an apartment center town at 19 with the basis of it's i'm right in the center of a great city at the time it was about 2009 so i knew even then i knew the markets are down it's probably long term it's gonna be a good yeah. play Bought something bang in the centre then. How much I, was it, if you remember? 250 it was, oh, bang okay, in the so centre. still, quite, still yeah, quite expensive. Yeah, yeah for, you know, for, this was a nice two-bed flat, yeah. still got it today. And um, about a year later, no, about 18 months, two years later, I bought another one in Bristol, mm -hmm. just down the road. Again, same concept, still relatively cheap. Down the road, I knew Bristol was a great city, had a lot of investment down there. Oh, I'll buy one there. A few years later, I managed to remortgage. First one, pulled out 100 grand, bought a few more houses in the Midlands through a source, which that's another story I, I don't want to go, we can go into, but I won't go into too much of it. But that's like the beauty of the good and bad of the investing world. But then I sort of was building up this small portfolio, but I got more and more passionate about property because I could see my career was coming to an end. So I think mm. this could be the right thing for and, me. And that's the thing I think about building up for, for people in that position that mm. potentially have short-term exponential mm. earnings when you buy that first property it's not going to make a difference no. in the here and now yeah and when you buy the second and third it's not going to be life-changing yeah. and it's probably not even going to be circumstance yeah. changing but what it is is it starts to when you start to get to five and six and you start to realize a real income from yeah. a portfolio that by the time you're you know on seven and eight mm. and you're five years in that you're not even putting more money in, yeah. you're refinancing yeah. from an existing I, I think we spoke, um, People, I think, is. sometimes, you forget property is a long-term game. Mm -hmm. People think all about the first year, squeezing percentages and all that, mm -hmm. but you shouldn't make you know um, short-term thinking on long-term assets or long-term mm -hmm. decisions, long-term investments. Like that, I just used that example. I didn't understand anything about numbers back then, zero about numbers, mm -hmm. but I bought an apartment 
five, six years later, I was paying down capital repayment time, but I, I basically pulled out all the money and more of what I put in, mm -hmm. which then went into more assets. Now, mm -hmm. I did that because property is very forgiving in the long term. Yeah. It is really forgiving long term, is, but you have to have a long term mentality. And I think people forget sometimes that it's, it's got to be a long term play as well. I, I know we're all blessed to have you know, so much education around to squeeze those percentages as best you can, but. The main thing is just buying assets, you know, a cash flow and assets that you have the great fundamentals around there that people want to live mm -hmm. there. You've got the, all the inflation around, things that are going to push your price up, but effectively you need that exit that people want to live there. You think there's a reason why value is going to go up and be able to cash flow it, make sure it's yeah. cash flow. If you can tick some of those boxes, our job is to try and make that as amazing as we can and squeeze those percentages. But look, I did it on, for my very first ones, it was basic, really basic. Mm -hmm. But it did really I think well a lot of the time, look, like you know, there's, there's 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 people, there's companies that will spend not just hundreds of thousands, but millions on knowing that like, the next in areas to invest in. Mm -hmm. So for me, like a tip for somebody who's just looking at, you know, they want to buy a buyer to let, they want to buy their yeah. first investment property, and are thinking in an area that they want to see capital appreciation, just follow the money. Like mm -hmm. if you see Barrett Homes are building, you know, tens of thousands of homes yeah. in an area chances are there's a reason you yeah. know there's a reason they're doing that if you see that there's a new train line coming mm -hmm. you know a new um amusement park a new shopping center mm -hmm. if you follow high level um in infrastructure yeah. investments chances are it's going to retain Absolutely. that demand if you go for city centers like not you know the new buzz area out of yeah. town that somebody's mentioning that might be good, might be bad, mm -hmm. but you know, if you fo like we talk about London yeah. as a nucleus, it just prices just work their yeah. way out, and you know, as soon as well, that's you know, it. Well, that's exactly why we set up our business, Greater Manchester, mm -hmm. because no, I, I mentioned before, but we, that's how we see it. We see Manchester as the London of the North, mm -hmm. so we're in Greater Manchester, and especially the South generally. How do you think the the, the, the Mancunians will feel about you calling them the London of the North? I think they've liked it so far. Have because they honestly, it? in the comments, yeah, can we I find out? Uh, well, anyone guys, from hey, Manchester that Chris has called you the London of the I, North. Yeah, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> Everyone I speak to, they love it. Because I mean, okay. Manchester has changed so much in the last 10 years. Because I, one of my first clubs, I went on loan to Stockport, ironically, when I came back from my knee at 18. Mm. Weirdly, I made my f Football League debut at Stockport. So I'm back up there mm. doing, you know, 12 years later. But back then, it was, it was, it was grim. And now, as an example, that is having you know, a huge regeneration. And, and that's what I talked about, about follow part, the infrastructure. Exactly. Part of the reason I moved up there for the business is because Greater Manchester is having that and there are other parts of the country of course with that sort of thing but mm -hmm. if you've got that mindset where you're looking at those strong fundamentals you talk about the employment you talk about schools transport links regeneration mm -hmm. if you can plug yourself into those areas and our job for, for my business is buying things that you can add value to as well mm -hmm. buying them at discount adding value good quality refurbs etc you're just ticking all those boxes to just maximize your long-term gains out of it yeah I'm we're going to try and get you as much as you can in year one but the likelihood is over year 5, 10, 15, 20, you're going to do really well. So on if we speak areas. about your business a little bit more, so obviously as an ex-professional footballer, mm. from my understanding, you, you know, are, are working with people, and I don't know if it's exclusive to footballers, yeah. but generally, you know, that's naturally your yeah. niche of people that you understand and they understand yeah. you, and you have an affinity with, that you work with them, and you effectively help them invest yeah. their money in property. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit more yeah, about well, the structure well, and how it works? Basically, because... When I retired, well, I look back to my head and nobody helped me in my uh, mm -hmm. career. Nobody was on my investing shoulder helping me whatsoever. And I wish now, from what I know, I was on my own shoulder at 20 years yeah. ago. I would, I would have had twice as many properties, twice as much cash for all this stuff. But when I retired, I didn't get any compensation. So mm -hmm. at 27 years old, I was told, if you carry on playing, you won't be able to walk in your 30s. You know, that was the end of my job. Um, I basically, me and my partner at the time split up, long-term partner. So when you talk about all the stats of players that are retiring, mm -hmm. you have things like... The, the level of depression from an early retirement is like three times as high as the average. People are divorced. I think in the first year, 25% of footballers are divorced. After three years, it's something like 75%. And oh. it's something like one in five are bankrupt after five years from premiership players. And that stats I'm reading off because I've known these for years. Yeah, yeah, no, and I lived them. it. You know, I lived that them. where lost a job, um, lost a dream, um, you know, something to strive towards, something I spent my whole life working towards. Then you're told, can't do it anymore. And you know, I went through a, a relationship breaker, and I thought, well, I didn't get any compensation for it, so that was gone. And it was lucky that property saved me, you know, mm -hmm. because property gave me that income that I had had those assets already over time. It was that was me off my own back that did that. So I wanted to be able to create something to do it for players because 
they are so busy with football. Football is so intense, it's a bubble. Mm. You've got to give everything. It's a performance based. You've got to like, do that. They, you know, they're, they're artists. They, they just, exactly. You just you leave them to do because you can't focus realistically. As much as you should think about mm -hmm. it, I think, and that's the thing where I think it's good that you know, both of us work with, with, with footballers yeah. and with, with other people from all sorts of high, high net worth yeah. industries. But realistically, if you're a specialist at something, as a footballer, you're a specialist in your field. Yeah. And it might be great to want to go out there and look at the occasional property, but realistically, you're going to detract from yeah. what you're doing that's allowing you to invest. 100%. If you think logically, they're, they're better off spend all their time being the best player yeah. they can be because they, they will earn more money in football than anything they ever do. Exactly, and it's, you know, it's, it's just time, the time, you have to look at their own time. Yeah. If you're getting paid, it doesn't matter if it's a thousand pounds a week or 10,000 yeah. or even way more money than that, you're not going to earn that elsewhere yeah. in the here and now. Absolutely. However, and that money's not going yeah. to be around and forever. And I caveat that with, it's a dream as well. You've got to remember, these guys, their passion is to be, for 90% mm -hmm. of is to be the best football they can be, to play in the Premiership, to play for their country, mm -hmm. to be a top player. So all of that means they have to focus 100% of their time into one thing. So I knew when I was playing, I had to do it off my own back. It was really hard. It was really hard. And you know, I made investment decision that I could have done better if I had someone like me on my shoulder. So I had this idea. I wanted to create a service for players so they could carry on with their football career, be as good as they can in that, and have someone who actually cares about them, rather than a lot of the other guys around, all the sharks and financial advisors around, who suck the life out of them on the side for no value. And I wanted to go, well, now nah, I'm one of them. I do it for my friends, colleagues. I want to keep it small, niche, but actually have the passion behind. Nobody did it for me, so I'm going to do it for you guys. You, you spoke about, like, obviously, different people around, and my experience from dealing with you know footballers, particularly you know, Premier League mm -hmm. footballers, so creme de la creme, is that a lot of the time in, in, in certain clubs, effectively you sign and it's like, here's your lawyer, mm -hmm. here's your financial advisor, here's your accountant, here's, you know, this, that and whatever. They're just assigned to you almost like a number. They know that they make money out of you. They got, yep. you know, they got a relationship with the club, but there's, they're very vanilla products mm -hmm. that they put you in. But then they also, because they make money out of the players, there's a lot of, gatekeeping to a degree Absolutely. where they don't they're scared that somebody else like yourself is mm. going to come in and start working with them um yeah well that's it i will like tone down some of my thoughts and so that and i will caveat there is always exceptions to the rule oh, and there's course. some really good ones 100 percent. but i have met far more of the wrong kind who hide behind it's in the best interests of the player and very quickly i've pinned a few of them down mm. to get actually we won't work with you as an example or won't hand the client because we can't make a fee out of you because I won't pay a fee. So as an yeah, example, totally. because it, I, that's totally against what I'm about. As in, because you're trying this to make is all personal. Like, everything we do is your we are working very hands hands on, intense. Because we, you know, our job, our business is almost like a concierge service mm -hmm. to a degree. We do absolutely everything for the player to be as hands free as possible. Because that's literally but, a player. That, like you said, they are earning the money they're mm. earning because they're amazing at what yeah. they do. They're in that top zero point one percent if not higher of what they're doing. Yeah. So as soon as they take their eye off the ball, then they may stop yeah. earning what they're earning. So what you really want is a complete turnkey, yeah. holistic product um, that deals with everything. Absolutely. Hey, see what you're doing. See you watching and you're not subscribing. So before you do anything right now, go and hit that subscribe button. Done it? Okay, let's go. Yeah, so um, yeah, I don't know if I can swear, but we've got a no dickhead policy in our in our um, midst because we, we give 120% to everyone, so it's really handheld. We we go above and beyond for all the players. So we have a really close connection to myself and Claire, our PA, Jay. We work so hard on it. So all the guys that we speak to, we have you know we call them direct when documents need to be signed straight mm -hmm. over, when monies need to be sent left, right, and centre. That you know they always pick up. They do what they need to do because you know we respect our time. We work so hard. We want their side of it is. They got to be receptive and open to it. So yeah. we only work with people that you know genuinely want to work and, and build something. Up. We don't work with people who are half-assed about it or doing it through another person. Just turn them away. The money is not the most important thing. It really isn't. It's about the people and working. Cause this is my passion project. I'm doing it for my community. This is you know my people. Mm -hmm. So if I want to give them the best result possible, it's got for people that I want to work yeah, with. It's, it's a two-way street. Obviously, 
you make money and mm. they make money and you both being invested in and being on the same path. I can't work with everyone. You know, yeah. I have, a, we, we'll shut the doors soon like because the, the business that we do, we can't do hundreds a year of this type. It's no, we just work with our core elite that we like and work consistently with and that'll be it. And then over time, there might be one that'll leave out and someone will come We might do some bigger stuff that we're working on. But generally, it's no, we work with who we want to work with consistently and we just do our best job possible for them. That's nice. So with the, your, your current clientele, like what type of projects are you working so on? So we mainly is buy to lets, generally. Mm -hmm. That's what we specialise in. So we buy projects. We started just South Manchester and now in Greater Manchester as a whole. So we started three or four years ago with three or four of my friends. And that's when I started. I said, mm -hmm. I've got this idea. I went to my friend, look, I've got this idea. My business partner, who I met on a, a development course, he uh, had a tech company, then built a big portfolio in sort of 9, 10, 11. And then I let an agency off the back of that. So whilst I had the contacts and the passion idea, he had the other side as what mm. I needed was the okay, experience so you got and the, the infrastructure teams. In place. And we just picked it. He was Manchester already, and I was already looking there. I think I think this is going to be a brilliant place to build portfolios out. There's so much going on in Manchester that's fantastic for investing. So I took the leap. I went up there, moved up there, basically, you know, on my own back. And from there, we built a performance property group. That's our business. And you know, it, like everything, so it took a few months to. We were starting from nothing, so we were meeting agents for the very first time. You know, building team up, even though we had teams of contractors, user letting agents stuff. It's the first time for us. So I see. Although you say buy to lets, like yeah. I've, I've been following you for a while. Yeah. And I see, I still see quite a lot of refurbishment. Yeah, and yeah. So are they tend to be properties that need work, or basically the Manchester market is so hot. Generally, mm -hmm. the way we've managed to get our best margins is we buy properties that need heavy refurbishment. Generally, mm -hmm. so. All our projects, we're spending 20, 30, 40 grand on mm -hmm. them. But my point is I get them at a price where it's worthwhile doing it because for, you know, for every two pounds you spend, you're trying to get a pound back generally, mm -hmm. or they're in a brilliant area where you might not get as much capital gains now, but I know this area in the next five, 10 years will be brilliant. Again, talking so, about that infrastructure. Absolutely. So it's some of the areas we bought. And so mainly, you know, we buy a lot of stuff on market. We buy a lot of stuff off market. We generally only buy cash because we raise a lot of private finance as well. So very rarely use mortgages when we're purchasing. But we're doing quite good volume now, and we started by just doing one or two here and there, and over time it went from doing a couple to doing three or four, then five or six, and now we're on about 12 or 13 sites, with another like 12 or 13 in legals, and got some blocks of apartments now that we're buying, and, and larger portfolios, so it's just, but it takes time, you've got to earn, your, you've got to learn, um, Citra, you've got to build the foundations, earn your stripes, and we're building, it's taken us three or four years to get to that level, and now it's hard, you know, it is hard, because it's a lot of work, and those sorts of projects, they're big, they're time intensive, but it's done really well as well, and, and you know, the guys have, have done so well over the last few years, um, I, you know, I'm really proud of that, but we're just now trying to scale that, you know, yeah. it's hard, I think that, it's that's, hard, that's what it is, it. and like a lot of, you know, things that you've highlighted, I think, are things that are a lot of the most successful people in the property space have highlighted. So the idea of specialization, yeah. so taking, you know, an area in Manchester and not just the whole of Manchester, but a specific yeah. area where you know, you know the difference between the good value yeah. and bad value and the right and that's the wrong it. area and the one that's got the right transport mm. links or school catchment yeah. area and all these things Huge. means that you know the right prices and you're so much more confident when telling an agent what mm -hmm. you can offer, you're not going back and having to say, actually, we're gonna yeah. have to, you know. And, and the thing is, it's volume as well, because the amount we're doing, I know so many agents are off mark. I know what I can and can't do. I know price per square meter, what our refurbs cost. Mm. I know what areas, because I've refinanced four in nearby streets. Yeah. I know what two bed terraces you know around the there. I know what three come back at. So I, and these guys we bought a lot through, so agents will give us stuff before it comes to market, because they know You're Chris will have one of those. That's, yeah. They literally, of course, I've got another Chris property for mm. it, because I know they'll know yeah, no, this is yeah. the sort of property I want. It's you know it's a probate, it's a repossession, it's got structural issues, it's got something. But mm -hmm. what you find in Manchester to buy a ready-made buy to let at a twenty percent discount, you'd be so you know yeah, you yeah. don't see them. You have to buy stuff you can add value to, you know, and that that's been our real success point. And I think that again, like talking about things that just tend to come up on this podcast again and again, the idea of just below market value and somebody just giving you a call and saying, "Hi, Chris, got another one of those below markets." If you're waiting for them. You might buy one every two years. Yeah, exactly. And, and you've I'm, got to add your own value. Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, I'm on it full time 
we've got a lot going on and we get maybe one of those a year, two of those a year. You know, it's not, people, the reason you get value is because most people don't want it, or they don't have 20, 30, 40 grand to spend in mm-hmm. the house, so they're willing to let someone else realize some profit because they know it's a problem property. And then from our side is we try and squeeze even more out by doing a really nice job, converting a two bed to a three bed, finding mm-hmm. value in something that others don't, legal issues you can find, all of that. Exactly. And because we always buy with cash, whether we raise privately or we buy full cash ourselves, it means we get ahead of a lot of other people mm-hmm. and then it's relationships. So it's proving your concept. Our big USP is we've never failed to complete when a sale's been agreed. That's from day one I and that's today and we st- we're what, 40, 50 projects on and we still kept that. And that's no, huge think, for us. I think that, you know, that, that speaks to a lot of things that you know, we, we speak about regularly. The idea of just integrity when building yeah. relationships, the idea of adding value. So like you said, whether that's the refurb, Um, whether that's adding an additional bedroom for an internal reconfiguration and then also that's solving a problem so the problem might be a legal issue a structural issue a damp issue but you're happy to take on a problem an element of risk but because of your expertise you know that you can deliver and then when you solve a problem you get paid a premium Mm -hmm. for the people who want the easy life who just want to buy on a residential mortgage and there's nothing wrong with that for those guys as well because they're being able to buy now at 5% yeah. without having to use a help to buy a scheme so they can buy an amazing yeah, home exactly. potentially that you've refurbished or... It's a, you know, it's a win forever, you know, and I also have a, Remember those jobs, you need teams to do that. Mm-hmm. This is when we talk about players. A player would find that almost impossible because we've got the teams to do it and it's taken time to mm-hmm. build that team. The, the contractors who can deliver it and even then it's hard to manage because everyone's so busy it's hard as you know in the world mm. the supply issues pricing issues so that to deliver all that is almost impossible on your own whilst you're, whilst you're playing nearly impossible that's yeah. why we had to build it ourselves to do it for others and they, like you mentioned the heavy works you know you create the value for that. i mean we completed on one today just before we got in that's underpinning mm-hmm. but that's underpinning a whole three bed semi that's yeah. a, you know, that's a big big job and then it's a full refurbishment on top that's a big project but we got it off market through an agent who recommended mm-hmm. this because I've already bought four through him. So he said, this is a problem property, have it before it comes to market, here's the vendor, bought it off market. And then we'll realize the profit, you know, would be fantastic in that because it's a problem that we can solve, you know? Exactly, and I think another thing I always like to ask people because, you know, everybody always wants to know how to get into property and how did you get started and what should you do? But I think a common denominator between behind a lot of people is they take experience from a previous role that may not be obviously beneficial, but has yeah. actually been really helpful. And as your yeah. time, as your time as a professional footballer, what sort of skill set would you say has enabled you to be successful? I think in it's discipline because sports, football is, is sports in general. Yeah. It's very, it's military like where you've you've been told to turn up at this point every day nine a.m. to do this. To, it's, you are ordered around because if you don't do that, you know, every someone will get ahead of you, yeah. and it's so dog eat dog. So one of the beauties that when they say sort of motivation is fleeting, you know, discipline is permanent. That's this, the, the discipline to get up and just get on with your tasks, you know, drive mm-hmm. and keep striving towards. I think sportsmen in general are, will be brilliant employees. You've just got to coach them and teach them the right direction to go. Because when mm-hmm. you give a sportsman, because they've been trained like this the whole life, if you can give them a passion, something to strive towards, they'll be fantastic. You know, I think it's funny, yeah, because... You often hear like negative things said about like the attitude of sportsmen, but then if you take people that were in the army mm-hmm. that have a similar background in terms yeah. of like the regimented yeah. having to do things at a certain time and be super focused, I know that like, ex army leavers are really highly yeah. valued in a lot of companies. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd say it's very similar in sports where if you can just give them something to stroke that really hits their passion, so they're, they've spent their whole life being disciplined, striving towards it, working really hard to be a professional to realize their dream. So. When I t- take that from my side, was well, I was used. I just moved the goalpost instead of trying to be the best footballer. Now it was well, I want mm-hmm. PPG to be the best it can be, and I've just been day after day after day. We just yeah. grind away, and it's all the small things. They're doing the small things consistently, being brilliant at the basics, and over time you can then scale up and go on to the next level. And that's what I think we've done well. Is we started on the simplest mm-hmm. stuff, got really good at that, and then we just did more and more, and then quietly now we're working our way up into larger no, and larger things. I can hear things. it. I can and, hear. I can hear the passion as you yeah, speak about uh, well, it. I can we, hear the excitement, which you yeah, know, which we work really hard on it. You no, know, we can, work really hard, it. and and I, I think the guys have really enjoyed it, and I enjoy working with them. But you know, it's full time. It's building your own business. It is you know, twenty four yeah. hours a day you do it, but you've got to love it as well. You have to love it if you want to get the best out of it. Definitely. And then, so if who would you say just very quick, like 
if, if you know, I know you said you know you're, you're busy at the moment, but potentially opportunities may like may, may may turn up soon. Who's your sort of ideal client or business partner to work with? Well, generally, we only work for footballers mm -hmm. because they're my client, and our players are Premiership and Championship players. We have a couple of players who have been League One, League Two, that almost like friends that were there from the start, so they they were good by us, and I do good by them. But generally, our guys are Premiership and Championship because we do recurring work, so we do two, four, six a year mm -hmm. of these projects because they're quite heavy, time intensive and then we build up portfolios that way. So that's our clientele really. And it's people that are looking for that sort of service. Someone that builds in the Greater Manchester, that's where we specialize. Mm -hmm. And we build single let portfolios that way. And now we're starting to do apartment block purchases, bigger portfolio purchases that we will be probably doing together or moving on to one person individually. And that's what we're moving into. Just the same concept as a single let, but just in bulk. Cause it's the same thing, apartment block is just maybe four, we're doing one of four and then one at a much larger one that it's just the same thing, it's just single, it's a way of doing four or five all in one go that we can add value to, whether that's legally, through splitting titles, or, or doing the renovations themselves, but actually the structure of it is just by yeah, letting steroids. Think, yeah, you know, once, really you, once you learn and you, you can take and adapt that skill set, yeah. you know, you can use it potentially to get to any level, yeah. you just gotta well, just scale you know, We've got one in planning for five apartments, so, but this is the problem with the planning side, that we, we try and stay away from planning more because that's been nearly a year to yeah. get approved. And that's the hard bit. So our business has been, we are in and out. We're volume based. We're yeah, in and out. We go on to it. That's and, super and, funny um, you mentioned that. And um, that's why we love the apartment and portfolio because if it's already cash flowing, but maybe it's under rented, it's been you know, left for 10, 15 years. That's the stuff that we're working on now rather than just developing because that can take a year or two to just see anything. It's funny that, you know, I think the, the good part about your business is it's very standardized. Mm. You know the entry, you know the times go, you know yeah. the exit. And because I work in different types yeah. of projects, like I do developments, yeah. I do stuff with planning, new builds, it means that sometimes, yeah, we can be in planning for 18 months, yeah. going back and forth. And if I've got an investor involved in that, there's a lot more ambiguity. And, you know, yeah. it's unless it's somebody who you've got an established relationship yeah. with, you know, it's hard to it's set really the goalposts uh, because you don't absolutely. know, and you don't want to, you don't want to under promise. And like, you don't yeah. want to underpromise because you're never going to get investment. Yeah. You don't want to overpromise and under deliver. Sure. And the bigger projects have more moving parts, more can go wrong. Yeah. We had two apartment block purchases fall through last year. It cost about six, seven grand each in legals that fell through. So nothing to show for it other yeah. than lose. And that's unfortunately, it's like part of a earning your stripes in that level. It's that happens because there are so many more things that can go wrong. Those legal issues around them are much bigger. But the great thing is if you can get them to go right, you can cover more ground. So yeah. that is the beauty of it. But I would say that that is something you build towards. We didn't go to apartment purchase on day one. Yeah. You know, and, and my bespoke got a massive portfolio. We've got other experience, but our job was to get excellent, be really good at the basics, do it, get a really good return on those and have a team that can do that, do it really well. And then it's just scaling up from there. Once you've got that foundation, be an expert at the next thing, be an expert at the next thing. And that's what we're on our journey of that really. And hopefully over the coming years, we can keep developing that and, and do more and more. We'll probably, not get too big on the single let's say we'll probably hit a limit because they're so time intensive and there's only mm -hmm. so much to do but then we'll try and do more of the large stuff and we're already marketing a lot to that and we've got some bigger ones we're purchasing now which are quite exciting and hopefully we can just do more and more yeah no, I'm excited I think you know you, you seem like you've got a lot of the parts to be yeah. super successful you've already got an established client base you've mm -hmm. got everything that's there um, and yeah I'm excited to see what 2022 wow. and you have to come spring. up and see it then. No, no, You're I'm gonna, gonna have to come, come up. up. I'm, I'm gonna commit here and now so. that I'm gonna come up. I'm gonna see it, and he's gonna take me for dinner. Yeah, because that was his commitment 100%. that I've assumed. But um, <laughs> split bill. I don't know about that, Monzo. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, that, that it, all, it all sounds really, really good. And for those people that are maybe listen, like listening to this rather than watching it on the yeah. YouTube. Where can they find you? Like, if somebody wants to reach well, out to you, really, you know, I only use Instagram because mm -hmm. I like to, I don't um, really mark so I just document what we're doing. So, my handle's uh, at Chris M. Ribeiro, and um, yeah, so I just document what we're doing on there. I've never marketed properly to players, I, I'm not really one for social media. I, I, it's a con, it's actually something I have to put effort into you know I don't naturally come to it so we're so busy on product I just try an update of what's coming on what's gone well what we're working hard on what's a problem all of this and now because we're on a lot of sites this hopefully people get something out of it and I'm going to try this year I've got some ideas of maybe building some sort of broadcast this where I can message people as like behind the scenes of the good the bad and the ugly of what's mm -hmm. going on people can get maybe fire questions and things more so oh, wow. I've, got, I've got I've got a structure in place that I'll follow oh you, amazing because so that's something that. I find I find social media really difficult because it's not natural mm -hmm. to me but 
we're doing a lot and I think there's more we can do there but I'm so busy because our next thing really we want to try and hire a project manager and eventually we'd like to get maybe someone more marketing but well, you know, we're building ourselves and that's the next stages for us we're probably not quite there yet but we'd love to get there and hopefully we can soon yeah no I believe I believe it's going to be there I think I know you believe it's going to you know get to exactly where you want it to be and Potentially, you know, the crazy part is that, you know, your, your property career might eclipse your playing career. Oh, and that's Maybe, maybe. Yeah. But the beauty for me, I get to work in the footballing world, but I don't have to be in all the politics for all the negative mm. side of it. I get to work with the guys who I want to work with, fun, and I get to look after them as best I can. So I can stay in the footballing world, the good bit of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't have to go through this dress and smash my knee to pieces every Fair day and, and, I'm, and have fans <laughs> shouting and cursing me every Saturday. I don't have to deal with that anymore. Fair enough. So our final question before we let you go, and it's the question we ask everybody, and potentially you can even direct it maybe towards more of a niche in like people that would from your experience. Yeah. But if somebody said I'm, you know, I'm 17, 18, 19, early 20s and I want to start investing in property, like what can I do now to prepare me? What what advice would you have for yeah. them? Well, my experience in property is you should ha- you you don't want it to try and be your sole f- source of income at the start for sure because property isn't the best vehicle for that it's about you've got to educate yourself there's so much free education out there mm-hmm. find people locally if you can there's so many people that will just answer your questions resourceful but you, my opinion is you start with the basics like anything become an expert at the basics so if it was me i would, would not worry about it trying to be my sole source of income at the start but try and find people who are doing the basics to me that's the buy to let model personally that's what i'm passionate about mm-hmm. And I think you go to someone who is an expert to that and you learn off them. And you will get your opportunity over time, whether that's in your early 20s, late 20s, you might find a way of raising private finance because anyone can do that once you, once you have confidence and you, know, and you have the team to deliver it, which takes time to build. But I've become an expert in your field and that is going to the basics. Once you can, maybe if you do your first project, it's not gonna be your best project ever. Mm-hmm. When it's ever the first time you do anything, your best one ever, you will quietly get better at it. And the more time you spend like anything, practice makes perfect. Spend time on it, spend time. And you, you'll you know if you get passionate about it. I think we are passionate about it. We speak yeah. well when it comes across in our voices. You'll know if you're passionate about it. And over time, you spend more time in those worlds, you will get the opportunities. It's it's The reason we do a lot is because I spend so much time and effort. I, I beat 90% of people because I'm the one on the phone more than them. I deliver every time. I build a relationship. That's how we've done it. There's no secret medicine to it. Mm. And we're nice to work with, but we deliver. We always give them results. And that's how we get opportunities. So I think... That's for people is that do it for one, don't fo- focus on it being your first source of income at first. F- f- go to the basics, go to the basics and find people locally, generally locally, it's so much easier that way, who do that and go and speak to them. Most people will take you under the wing and help you and then you've got to go and do it. That's it, I think that's some great advice. That is a wrap. That's another episode of The Property by Kazi Podcast. We are back each and every week with a brand new episode. We're going to have hundreds of years worth of property experience by the time we finish this first season. So if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe. Have you done it yet? It's just there, subscribe. Like this video, comment, all that good stuff. If you've got any questions for myself or Chris, let me know. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.